Charging uh, my office, the DA's office has had our gang prosecutor, Deputy District Attorney Lindsay Bittner. Um, in he was found by the jury to be not guilty of that account. That's correct. Right. Okay. All right. Um, I have a record. Just what's at stake and just how to make sure my police department performs at a high level and partners with our partners. Um, the gang is going to help you get money or protection, but in the end, it will destroy. Today, um, our anticipation is that it will be uh, charging all three individuals with murder. First degree. You Look forward to possible grandchildren. The last thought we would ever have is that we will have to plan their funeral. Together and deemed it appropriate as some form of consideration for that taking of responsibility. It wouldn't be appropriate for us to comment on ongoing investigations that we currently have, but I can uh, uh, assure you. A dispute between two groups of people uh, inside the restaurant. Let's go to some video. It's still my joy will not stop me from growing into the best version of myself. Number 16, Christopher Lockett. Man or woman, gangs show no mercy to either gender. We will start with the story of Christopher Dean. In October 2016, Christopher Dean, 33, of Lithia Springs, was lured to the Atlanta home of Xavier Gibson and his brother, 30-year-old Orlando Gibson. Dean was under the assumption that he was invited to complete a drug deal between himself and another man, Christopher Lockett, all members of the Gangster Disciples Street Gang. Instead, what the visit turned out to be was an intense and brutally long torture session, which eventually led to his demise. You see, before the visit, Lockett had learned that Dean had once been a police witness in California. For more than an hour, Dean was beaten with a 2x4 and crowbar. After the deed, the Savage crew allegedly shot Dean twice in the back of the head. The cold-blooded slaying was an effort to show other gang members that any police informant activity would not be tolerated. Lockett had paid Jasper Green, 27, and Lamar Allman, 25, to clean up the gruesome scene and burn Dean's body as well as his car. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, is the defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, very good. April the 1st of 2019, on indictment, indictment number 17 SC 149 of this hearing, on count one of the indictment participation in criminal street gang activity, the sentencing range minimum is 10 and the maximum is 20 or life. The count eight aggravated it was found by the jury to be not guilty of that account. That's right. Okay, all right. Um, I have a record of all the evidence, whatever is going to be submitted, victim impact or otherwise, from both the state as well. Since this conviction and while the trial is pending, I've had an opportunity to review those previous convictions for sentencing as it pertains to Mr. Lockett only. On count one, criminal street. But the body was in such grisly condition that they instead dumped the corpse in the trunk of his car and left the vehicle in the parking lot of the Hamilton E. Holmes subway station thus becoming the cause for Lockett's downfall. Atlanta police discovered the body and seven suspects were arrested. Lockett, Xavier Gibson, Quatez Clark, 21, Joshua Rooks, 27, and Jasper Green, 27, were brought up on various charges, including the slaying. Finally, in April 2019, a judge sentenced Lockett, the ringleader, to life without parole. Quatez Clark received two life sentences. Jasper Green, Joshua Rooks, and Xavier Gibson received life sentences. We all have empty space in our hearts for Chris. Aaron, his youngest son, he was one when Chris passed. Got to see the comings and goings and essentially murder headquarters happening at Mr. Mr. Christopher Lockett's will merge. Aggravated assault will merge into count two, malice murder. Count nine, aggravated will will be 10 years. Um, are there any questions about the courts? relate to how you must feel, except as a parent, I know that, that it has um, to, to make better choices, um, even that your own son made. But, um, I, and um, quite frankly, or, or why, I, I guess, was the question. It was better um, than what took place. But um, we have a system. They kept an open mind until it was time for them to deliberate. They deliberated um, over 20 years to be served um, concurrently. We have count seven. We want to discuss um, your options at this point with your attorney, Mr. Hudson. Number 15, Montana Baronet. In February 2019, Montana Baronet, the 23-year-old man Baltimore police once dubbed the city's number one trigger puller, 
was sentenced to two life terms, meaning he will likely never get out of prison. Such was the terror spread by the culprit that only one person spoke on behalf of the victims. Most declined to make statements out of fear for their own security. This courageous woman was Valencia Bullock, the mother of Antonio Addison, who was slain on his grandmother's front steps by the culprit. Tongue in cheek, Baronet apologized to her and her relatives for the heartache and pain they believed he had caused. He was a good friend, Baronet said in a brief statement. I gave him advice for staying off the streets. In actual fact, this smooth operator headed the train-to-go drug operation that operated out of the Sandtown neighborhood. He grew up on the streets on Baltimore and adopted this as a way of life at the tender age of 13 and over the years developed a reputation for ruthlessness. The list of his transgressions was a long one. Baronet was part of a group of masked men who fired more than 50 rounds near the University of Maryland Baltimore campus in July 2015 who were born and raised and continue to live on the streets of Baltimore who don't make that choice that Mr. Baronet. Vic and Denise, it's likely he'll never get out of prison. Convicted killer Montana Baronet. They believed he did. His relatives said Baronet is not a monster, but the judge didn't believe. Just what's at stake and just how to make sure my police department performs at a high level and partners with our partners no matter. What struck me is that over the past four nights, I've met with hundreds upon hundreds of people. The defendants, there were reports of witness intimidation and several U.S. Marshals were assaulted. That incident took the lives of three people, including two bystanders. This criminal got the honor of having Baltimore's new police commissioner designee, Michael Harrison, watching the proceedings from the front row amidst tight security in the courtroom. The trial was so high profile that the public and media could not bring phones inside. They were instead placed in locked boxes until the end of the proceedings. Even being put in the slammer did not bring down the spirits of this gang at the trial. The entire proceedings were rife with stories of various tactics being used against the law enforcement officers and the public. There were reports of witness intimidation, and three co-defendants were charged with trying to rough up a U.S. Marshals who escorted them to the courtroom daily. Their conduct during the trial proved that these were not upstanding citizens of the local community but rather the thugs they actually were, highly deserving of being behind bars and the key to the lock being thrown away. Robbing and kidnapping rival drug dealers and engaging in murder for hire. Yes, Baltimore, there is a robust, active crime strategy. And anyone who says more is either intentionally uninformed or operating off of ulterior motives. Pete Offender is in Baltimore City. We are certain he has been involved in, believe me, it's a positive, we're not trying to hide anything from you, but at this point, the active investigations take precedence. And Number 14, the Trinitario Gang. It seems that gang activity is the scrooge on humanity, with its tentacles reaching deep into society and affecting the innocents, even if they have nothing to do with their nefarious activities. The heart-rending tale of Lisandro Jr. Guzman Feliz is still available on social media and has not lost any of its brutality, even with the passage of time. His story requires nerves of steel and a strong heart for digestion. On June 20, 2018, at 11.30 p.m., 15-year-old Lissandro Jr. Guzman Feliz left his apartment to meet with a friend. While out, he noticed four vehicles and became alarmed. He began to run and was chased for several blocks by gang members occupying the vehicles. Eventually, Guzman Feliz sought refuge in a bodega at Bathgate Avenue and East 183rd Street in Belmont, Bronx, near his residence. Junior, it was caught on camera, shocking not just New York City, but the entire country, as millions of people took part in one of the most disturbing murders that this city and this nation has never to lose his song in the way. I lose my song, Junior. Gang is going to help you get money or protection. But in the end, it will destroy. I'm still waiting for the divine justice. The divine justice has to come for them too. People demanded that these 13 gang members pay for what they did. The store owner and others witnessed the attack, but initially prevented Junior from hiding behind the counter, being at first unsure of precisely what was occurring. After recognizing Junior and seeing his fear, the store owner relented and allowed him behind the counter but it was useless as Junior was nevertheless spotted by one of the gang members who then proceeded to drag him outside where three others waited. The incident was captured on CCTV video inside the shop as well as on cell phone video taken from an overhead angle by a resident of one of the building's upper floors. The cell phone video shows a dozen or more males arriving and departing at the scene. 
Bodega surveillance footage shows several men jabbing Guzman Feliz with large objects and machetes. The video shows Guzman Feliz re-entering the store, however, he appeared to be sent outside. The video shows him stumbling out of the bodega and running east on 183rd Street towards St. Barnabas Hospital, one block away. Cell phone footage showed Guzman Feliz collapse on a step at a security booth a few yards from the hospital entrance. The video shows witnesses who knew the victim screaming frantically, holding cloths to his wounds and attempting to console him as he died. Guzman Feliz's slaying occurred only minutes after the attack at the bodega. A Trinitario gang leader stated on Snapchat that the slaying was a case of mistaken identity. The slaying of Guzman Feliz was purportedly a case of mistaken identity of a teen who was part of a rival gang. The police reported that the perpetrators, all members of the Trinitario subset Los Sures, mistakenly believed that Guzman Feliz was a member of the rival Sunset Gang. Bronx County District Attorney Darcel Clark said that Guzman Feliz had no ties to any gang activity. And just like that, they tried to brush the entire incident under the carpet, but was the public willing to let it go? The brutal slaying had a significant impact upon the bodega owner. The bodega owner's mother had a heart attack after viewing the security footage of the incident and passed away. The bodega owner himself had thoughts of self-harm and had to seek psychological therapy. Public outrage ensued when the graphic video of Guzman Feliz's slaying began to circulate on the internet. Police tip lines received a torrent of calls from witnesses and other people identifying the suspects. Officers' posts on Twitter and Instagram were shared and viewed over 100,000 times. A hashtag, Justice for Junior, was created and went viral on social media outlets such as Twitter and Instagram. With the wave of public outrage not dying down, the men were apprehended forthwith. Nearly a full year after Guzman Feliz was slain outside of the Bronx bodega, five accused suspects were convicted of his slaying. In a Bronx courtroom on June 14, 2019, a jury convicted Joneki Martinez Estrella, Manuel Rivera, Elvin Garcia, Jose Muniz, and Antonio Rodriguez Hernandez of their activities. Punished in the same order. Now, as of this live shot, we know that Diego Suero, uh, one of the two, how much time Frederick will serve, um, that is going down as we speak. But as you can imagine it's been a long four years to life. Uh, again, this sentencing is taking place as of this live shot. You can imagine it's been an emotion. So let's go ahead and show you some video that we were able to gather right before this live shot. This was around 1045. The judge did not let us record video, but we were allowed to take still pictures, and that's probably what you're seeing here. The mother's she did. Which means you plead guilty to two separate charges, one more serious than the other. There are certain conditions that serious charge gets withdrawn and vacated, and you get sentenced on the more lesser charge. It's immediately taken away by court officers. Cross examination is expected to begin. Number 13, Abel Galagos. In 2018, Duran had tried to play the role of an upstanding citizen of the community by identifying one of the men, Alonso Quintana, 28 of Denver in a lineup as a suspect in an attempted slaying investigation in Adams County. In early November 2018, Duran, who had been approached by 36-year-old Abel Candy Galagos of Lakewood on social media, met with him, Rene Francisco Rosales, 36, of Lakewood, and some other people at a house in Denver. The reason why she agreed to meet with these dangerous men is still not clear, but she paid dearly for this decision. Duran, Galagos, and Rosales left the house together and Rosales went home. Meanwhile, Galagos took Duran to a parking lot at W. Colfax and Kipling, where he had previously arranged to meet with Quintana. Quintana and Galagos maltreated Duran and imprisoned her in the back of the car before they drove her to a dark, secluded spot at West 7th Avenue and Nile Street in Golden. Outside the car, Galagos and Quintana shot Duran ten times. The men then left the area. They miss her and they ask about her every day. They wake up in the middle of the night crying for her. I am struck by the, the casualness in, in which it was committed, the absolute difference crying as you're let out of the courtroom to serve the rest of your life in prison. Galagos and Rosales returned later and poured gasoline on her body and set it on fire. Firefighters responding to a call about a brush fire at that location found her body around 1.30 a.m. The three men were arrested individually on November 8, 9, and 20, 2018. Galagos was arrested on an unrelated charge before he was formally charged in connection with the incident. 
Quintana, who was identified as a habitual criminal, was sentenced to life in prison, plus 160 years. This was his third felony conviction. Rene Francisco Rosales, 36, of Lakewood, was sentenced to 150 years in prison. This was his seventh felony conviction, according to the district attorney's office. The third man, 36-year-old Abel Candy Galagos of Lakewood, was sentenced on January 31, 2020, to life in prison plus 163 years. The men were all tried together, and each was found guilty on multiple counts for their role in the slaying on January 29, 2020. Number 12. Adam Pate They say never judge a book by its cover, but you can't help but do so when you look at this white supremacist with a split tongue and Satan tattooed on his face, who was sentenced to life in prison for jabbing a black man to his end. David Adam Pate from Lancaster, North Carolina, was the born-again Ku Klux Klan wannabe who lured his friend, 33-year-old Ricky James, into some woods with wine in November 2013. But what he had planned was not a night spent in an alcoholic haze, instead jabbing him 39 times. Ricky's remains were discovered by children playing in the woodland who had ventured to the secluded spot while looking for their lost dog. You're charged with murder. Do you understand what you're charged with? Yes, sir. And you understand that murder? My brother was, um, as the solicitor gave me the review of what was going on in the case, why well, I was saying I want to talk to you, look like this, but my brother was the same person who that the trunk, you know, he hit me. Immediately, Pate was suspected, who was already in custody as a result of a disorderly conduct charge two weeks ago, but were forced to wait for the results of an autopsy before they could charge him with the sling. Meanwhile, during a thorough checking of his house, police found at least 20 knives, both store-bought and handmade, and more than 20 masks in Pate's home. He later confessed to his mother that he enjoyed his actions immensely. The 25-year-old serial perpetrator pleaded guilty to the slaying in 2015. During an interview after his arrest, the unapologetic Pate even blamed the victim for the slaying, saying that it was his fault and that why would anyone go drinking and go into the woods with someone who looked like him? Obviously, the poor man misplaced his trust by not judging this particular book by its cover. But where's the gang connection, you ask? The tattoos on his face tell a story of their own. His face is covered in amateurish tattoos, including the words Satan above his right eyebrow, fear on his right eyelid, and the numbers 974 on his throat. 974 is a number said to be strongly linked to the US-based street and prison gang, Gangster Disciples. Well, this disciple headed right where his gang was meant to be, to prison. Number 11, Pedro Espinoza. Jamil Shaw was another bright flame snuffed out by gang activity. He was his community's star player who had carried the ball 74 times for 1,052 yards this season with an average of 14.2 yards per carry. He had a bright future ahead of him, but any chances of realizing it went up in smoke on March 2, 2008. His father told the 17-year-old high school football star to be home before dark. That is exactly what he was trying to do when just before dusk, shots rang out as he was just three doors from his house. Gang members pulled up in a car and asked Shaw if he was in a gang. Pedro had thought that Shaw was a Bloods gang member because he was wearing a red backpack. In fact, Shaw was carrying a Spider-Man backpack. That bag pack sealed his fate as Shaw wasn't given the time to tell them no. He was mowed down before he could answer. His dad heard the shots from inside his house and immediately called his son's cell phone to warn him to stay away. But within seconds, the father realized what had happened. He was my hero. I told him, man, you're my hero. I was like, what gang you from? <clears throat> he didn't answer, and they shot him. He's not a gangbanger. That, you know, on the streets, 
did. That was my son, and people don't understand that. Served. The allegation in the Penal Code Section 186.22 subdivision. The a defendant is ordered remanded to the custody of the Sheriff of Los Angeles County without bail to be a delivered to the warden of the California prison at San Quentin for the execution of this death sentence. Be executed upon the final a, de a determination of the appeal, the affirmation. Therefore, you, the Sheriff of the County of Los Angeles, are hereby commanded to California State Prison at San Quentin are hereby commanded to receive Pedro Espinosa. More than 7,500 miles away, his mother, Army Sergeant Anita Shaw, was serving her second tour in Iraq when she was informed that her son had been slain on the streets of LA where he was supposed to be safe. Anita Shaw flew back to Los Angeles to bury her son. Police soon announced that an arrest had been made in the shooting. Pedro Espinosa, a 19-year-old member of the Hispanic 18th Street Gang, had been released from jail where he was held on a charge of battery with a deadly weapon one day before the incident. Espinoza had been released from jail shortly on an unrelated charge and had been counseled by an officer who warned him of the consequences of further criminal behavior. Pedro Espinoza took pride in his gang affiliation and had told authorities he was willing to slay for his gang, even if it meant going to Demise Row. His actions while incarcerated should have been taken as an indication of his mindset. Incidents like these continued to happen while he was in jail. For example, Espinoza stuck his arm through a food tray slot in his cell and used a jail-made weapon to slash another inmate as he walked by in June 2009 before flushing the weapon down a toilet in his cell. Espinoza later said the inmate had it coming and had been running his mouth since he got here, and yet he was released into the hapless society. Superior Court Judge Ronald H. Rose imposed that very sentence, ordering Espinoza taken to San Quentin State Prison. The judge rejected defense arguments that the 23-year-old didn't get a fair trial. Interestingly, this incident sent off a fierce immigration debate in the U.S. Espinoza was brought to the U.S. from Mexico by his mother when he was just an infant. Espinoza, though he had grown up in the U.S., was still undocumented, a fact due to which the Shaw family actually sued the Los Angeles Police Department in 2009 for releasing Pedro from jail even though he was undocumented. Upon the judgment here and becoming final, you are commanded to carry into effect the on a date to be here and after fixed by this court in a warrant of execution at which a defendant is also ordered to pay uh, to the State Victim Compensation Board. He was a football player and he was a good brother. It's just devastating. It's just devastating that, that, that both of these young men were together. I committed under the special circumstance that the defendant intentionally killed uh, Jamil Shaw II. After further the activities of that criminal street gang, the defendant, Pedro Espinosa, shall be put. The a court further imposes a consecutive sentence of 25 years to life. Just go and kill somebody for his blood. Um, it's the coward's way out. I'm a Christian because I can't turn around and say I forgive you for killing my son. You should thank God if you have your... Can't do no more than that, man. The family of uh, Jamil Shaw says that the voters should be thinking about how they would feel. Number 10, Tariq Jackson. Keandre Duff, 20, was shot and slain on July 12, 2015 at a block party on Brook Street that was attended by more than 100 people. The shooting occurred on Cross and Ballard Streets, which was just a few feet away from the Eastern Michigan University campus. Shots were fired between two groups of young men. Three of them were captured and taken into custody. Duff, who was shot in the head, was slain in retaliation for the slaying of 17-year-old Keon Washington, who was slain at a party the previous summer in Ypsilanti. Duff was charged in Washington's demise, but charges were eventually dropped due to lack of evidence. No mother deserves to bury her son and no mother deserves to see her son changed. My bad choice led to a lose-lose situation. I won't be able to hug mine for a while, and my mom won't be able to hug me for a while, so it's a sad situation where that I'm not even that type of person. You know, the lifestyle that I chose to live put me in a situation, you know, full of pride, caught in the streets, and in the middle of, in the middle of gangs and all type of other stuff. Possibility for my actions and the way to face the consequences. I want to use my time to make me a better person. It's been four years. She hasn't got justice or peace of mind because the killer of her son still walks free. Attention to my brother, Jamar, and everybody, you know, all the, everybody around my age and other people that I'll be with, you know.
Well, that didn't stop Jackson from his cronies from taking revenge, since Duff's slaying set off a series of tit-for-tat actions between the gangs, leading to seven shootings between rival gangs, BOH and Racklife. Police have said Duff belonged to Racklife and Washington was a part of BOH. The shootings spanned the city of Ypsilanti and Ypsilanti Township. Tariq Jackson was sentenced by Washtenaw County Trial Court Judge Carol Kuhnke on Tuesday, March 21, 2017. The 18-year-old will serve 17 to 40 years in prison, but at his sentencing, Jackson nodded along during the victim impact statement and apologized to Duff's family when he was given a chance to speak. Too little too late, though. Are targeting recent gang violence. We will identify you. We will find you. The violence has, has escalated and mimicking gang culture by way of fights. Why didn't they do it when the first person was, was killed? The fathers and mothers, I call you out today. Corruptors program, that is a volunteer-based program that aims to engage the public. We'll have more information on that. Number nine, Lee Mawel Rios. In 2015, Lopez's body was found around noon on March 25 in the yard of a house at Dwight and Calhoun Streets in the city's North End. Police said he was shot sometime overnight. Suspecting gang activity, the police were able to narrow the suspect list down and Lee Rios was held and his co-conspirators, namely Valerie Medina, 22, Daryl Self, 19, and Jonathan Guevara, 18, were also apprehended. After Rios emerged as a suspect in Lopez's murder, police obtained warrants for his arrest and to search his Nursery Street apartment. This proved to be the jackpot the police had been praying for as they found a treasure trove of forearms at his residence. Not such a tough guy when faced with the police's finest, Lee started singing like a canary. He later tried to have his statements he made to police dismissed as evidence, telling the judge that he was too high on drugs to understand his Miranda rights. <laughs> no dice. Lee was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, an honor indeed for a reputed member of the Latin Kings street gang. Number 8. Michael and Anthony Carpio On April 24, 2013, Anthony and Michael Carpio, two brothers, approached Orellana as he played handball at Grover Cleveland High School in 2013. The defendants issued a gang challenge and a fight ensued. Witnesses said that Anthony Carpio jabbed Orellana during the fight multiple times in the head neck and upper body, and then ran into a vehicle driven by their companion, Pineda, who drove the van as both Carpio brothers sat expressionless. Anthony Carpio, 18, was sentenced to 16 years to life, and Michael Stephen Carpio, 20, was sentenced to 15 years to life for the incident on October 31, 2015. We plan to dance at their wedding, celebrate a promotion, look forward to possible grandchildren. They were found guilty of second-degree murder. Their victim, 18-year-old Kevin Oriana, was stabbed to death on... Look forward to possible grandchildren. The last thought we would ever have is that we will have to plan their funeral. For parole until the year 2028, and by then, both of them will be in their early 30s. In 2020, Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Martin Herskovitz, who presided over the Carpio trial, granted Anthony a transfer hearing in juvenile court to determine whether he should have been treated as a juvenile or an adult. If the motion is granted, he would be out pretty soon. It seems such a travesty of justice since he was the one who had been wielding the weapon. Definitely a poor turn of events as the victim's family this once again had to relive the nightmare. Number 7. Lisandro Antonio Posada Vasquez 17-year-old Raymond Wood was lured out of his home by a drug deal on March 27, 2017. He was then abducted and taken to Roaring Run Road where he was found with 29 stab wounds to his body his body bearing the signs of the torture he had endured. That has uh, finally gotten to a day of justice for Raymond Wood and his family. Posada Vasquez together and deemed it appropriate as some form of consideration for that taking of responsibility. Time. This was a horrific crime and it required even with the acceptance of responsibility. Posada Vasquez was responsible for some of the fatal jab wounds, one of the alleged MS-13 gang members charged with the incident. The slaying had to be brutal because as a gang member goes up in rank, the more brutal the injuries are, 
so that's why the ones accused took turns jabbing Wood. Danny Ventura of Maryland drove Posada Vasquez, Christian Sanchez Gomez, and Kevin Soto Bonilla from Maryland to Lynchburg to meet up with Victoria Rodas and Josu Correas Ventura, providing a helping hand in the entire incident. Thus, Correas Ventura, Soto Bonilla, and Sanchez Gomez are also charged for their participation in the act in association with a street gang. One more defendant uh, that responsibility, a very lengthy prison sentence. Number six, Sean Dank Garrant. Sean Garrant, 31, was the undisputed leader of the Roland 30s Crips. He learned about the Los Angeles-based gang from cellmates while serving prison time for an earlier murder and organized a Roanoke chapter after his release about six years ago. As head honcho of the Roanoke street gang that dealt drugs, recruited members from city high schools. It's a long list of misdeeds that can be laid at the feet of this gang, but two slayings committed by its members trump all else. The slaying was part of a complicated series of events. It began when Garrant ordered a gang member identified only as DF. Today, because of the conviction of three Roland 30s gang members, including the gang leader. You skid kids right from wrong at home, this will continue to be a problem. It wouldn't be appropriate for us to comment on ongoing investigations that we currently have, but I can uh, uh, assure you that we can make this a federal crime. Did previously plead guilty to related charges and is expected to be sentenced later this year. In court records to slay Lee. Because he was reaching out to the rival's bloods, DF refused to slay Lee. At that point, Garrett ordered Lee to slay DF for his disloyalty. Lee also disobeyed the gang leader's command, warning DF to flee after they were both driven to a Northwest Roanoke apartment complex the night of June 14, 2017, under the guise of meeting some girls at a party. As part of a so-called contingency plan, Mac and Casey chased Lee behind an apartment building and took a firearm he was carrying. Mac then shot Lee twice in the back after he had fallen to the ground. It did not end there. The following year, 23-year-old Markel Gertie was slain after a dispute broke out about the marijuana he was carrying near the Lansdowne Park public housing complex, where the gang's drug operation was headquartered in a trap house. Garrant was not present for either slaying, but prosecutors said he directed them as the leader of the gang. Two co-defendants, fellow gang members DeMonte Murda Mack and Trayvon 30 Casey, who admitted they had slain at Garrant's command, were also sentenced. Lee's demise brought attention to the Roland 30s, which unlike previous gangs in Roanoke, had a high level of organization that included initiation rites, a set of rules that included the wearing of blue colors to show loyalty, and an intensive recruiting effort aimed at vulnerable young men in the city's two high schools. Sam Garrett was sentenced to 37 years in prison in August 2022. Number 5. Gang of Robbers It's clear that gang members have varying reasons for getting into their illegal activities, but one reason trumps all. It's all about the money and this particular gang made no bones about their fixation on money. The gang used a fleet of stolen cars to travel to and from the violent heists in London, Oxford, Bedfordshire, and Northamptonshire between May 2018 and November 2019. They stole 400,000 pounds during the time. Some of the stolen money was stained by security dye when the gang tried to force open a cash box, leading them to burn some and launder some through betting machines and bookmakers. They were using stolen vehicles, clone number plates, uh, displayed a knowledge of police tactics. Uh, a hidden mobile phone. Police later discovered they used it to coordinate more robberies. They also tried to cover their tracks by using cloned number plates on the stolen cars. But the Met Flying Squad had the gang under surveillance using number plate recognition cameras and phone evidence to track what they were doing. Six members of the gang have already been jailed, and another four were sentenced later. Brooklyn McFarlane, 27, from Wandsworth, South London, was jailed for 13 years. Abdi Omar, 27, also from Wandsworth, was sentenced to nine years. Madi Hashi, 29, of Wandsworth, and Nauman Amin, 26, from Clapham Junction, were each jailed for nine years. Number 4. Deontre Green The bustling IHOP in Ronkonkoma descended into chaos back in March, when Green opened fire on arrival as he sat in a booth, as a video from the restaurant showed. Is a, uh, the, the arrestee from the IHOP is a blood gang member. I do believe that both parties... Liz, the lockdown in the area has been lifted. We are 50 miles east of the city, Lake Ronkonkoma, Long Island. That uh, this incident uh, was a targeted shooting. This is not something 
who is committing a random shooting. This appears to be targeted. A dispute between two groups of people uh, inside the restaurant. Let's go to some video. Diners could be seen scrambling from their tables as Green whipped out his firearm, firing at least four rounds at point-blank range at the man who approached his table. The alleged Bloods gang member was sentenced to 15 years in prison for the incident. Later, DeAndre Green, 20, had pleaded guilty to attempted slaying, use of a firearm, and numerous other charges. The victim, Tyreek Corbin, 20, was injured with a thankfully non-life-threatening wound. Number 3. Titus Lee On November 22, 2016, Titus Lee attacked a couple as they were sitting on the porch of their apartment on Litchfield Way. Lee lived with his mother and sister in the same apartment complex. Lee, the victim testified, whipped him, causing a wound that later required over a dozen staples to close. Afterwards, the former college student testified that he was tied up in a closet while Lee attacked his girlfriend. That defendant be in prison for a minimum of 240 months, maximum 348 months. It means that you know harder than it was ever supposed to be. My innocence is now gone. I found a friend for death. Things that are supposed to be easier now are hard because I've got someone looking over my shoulder. And it's still my joy will not stop me from growing into the best version of myself. Over the course of an incident that lasted for hours, the victims said they were driven to an ATM and forced to withdraw cash. They also had their Xbox and other electronics stolen. They said Lee told them he would find them and slay them if they called the police. Terrified, they drove all the way to the male victim's parents' house in Cherry Grove, South Carolina for help. Lee was arrested weeks after the attack in Philadelphia by U.S. Marshals. In May 2021, he was sentenced to more than 100 years in prison. Number 2. The Garay Brothers In April 2019, Daniel Fuentes became the victim of another gang when three men, Robert Garay, 30, Gabriel Garay, 23, and Nathaniel Jara, 24, got out of their car when they saw Fuentes, and Robert Garay shot him. After being shot, Fuentes knocked on a neighbor's door in the 2200 block of Beach Street and collapsed inside the home. Beach uh, Street in Oceano regards a uh, possible assault with a deadly weapon away from his uh, injuries. Over the past four months, uh, our detectives have been, uh, their extensive follow-up uh, with tips from the public uh, were able to eventually as a result, they made the arrest of three individuals pictured to my right, your left. Fuentes was allegedly targeted by the trio because of a long-standing beef over a runaway family member. Text messages from Fuentes' phone that indicated Fuentes and his family were concerned that a female family member was hanging out with the Garay brothers. Tensions mounted on April 2, the day before the shooting, when texts show that a family member of Fuentes reached out to a mutual friend who was also friends with the Garays telling the person to leave Daniel out of it. That person said it was already too late. Robert Garay was sentenced to 30 years to life in state prison, and Gabriel Garay and Jara were each sentenced to 13 years and four months in state prison after they pled guilty to the charges. Charging uh, my office, the DA's office, has had our gang prosecutor, Deputy District Attorney Lindsey Bittner, um, in today. Um, our anticipation is that it will be uh, charging all three individuals with murder first degree, which means that our allegation is that they committed this murder for the benefit of the furtherance of their gang interests in the Superior Court in Department 3. Number 1. Mistaken Identity Just after 4 a.m. on June 13, 2014, shots rang out, over and over and over. Atlanta police raced to respond to a 911 report of a street shooting. In the driver's seat of a silver Hyundai, they found 18-year-old Darius Bottoms, nephew of Councilwoman Keisha Lance Bottoms. A CSI unit processed the crime scene and recovered 18 spent 9mm shell casings, but only one bullet went through the windshield, struck Bottoms in the forehead and slaying him. Police learned that eight days after Bottoms was slain, 18-year-old David Wallace was arrested for possession of a stolen firearm, which was determined to be one of those used in Bottoms slaying. The serial number on it revealed that it had been stolen from a site in Clayton County a day before Bottoms was slain. As for the motive, police discovered Bottoms was targeted by mistake. A witness told investigators that he was the victim of a mistaken identity. The young woman explained that the night before Bottoms was slain, Bowdery's stepfather had been shot and severely injured in front of his house. Bowdery believed that the shooter drove a light-colored Hyundai, so when Bowdery and his cohort spotted Bottoms' car, they believed they'd found the person who'd shot Bowdery's stepfather. Bottoms was a fatal victim of retaliation. 
Barbert, then 19, Bowdery, then 23, and Wallace, then 22, were convicted for the slaying and other charges and were sentenced to life in prison. That's all we have for you folks. Join us next time.